I remembered I wanted to ask you a bit about the the craze. You said that you mentioned you 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 knew them in prison, or you knew what was it Reggie? You I knew? knew Reggie. Yeah, I met Ronnie when he came to visit Reggie in Maidstone Prison, where where I was with with Reggie. I was sort of banged on this side of the landing. Reggie was where you are opposite me, so we were banged up opposite each other for about three and a half years. So I met Ronnie when he came to visit Reggie after I think it was their mother died or someone died in their family, so they were brought together for one of the very first times. Right. So how how long how close were you to to Reggie? Well, I, you, you say close, I mean, um, he, he'd come into my cell and have conversations. There were some conversations I wouldn't repeat here, but I'm going to write it in my book because I want to sell my book. <laughs> Get that promo but, in. But I, I knew him well. You know, he was an old divering man, to be honest with you. You know, he'd been in prison for 35 years and, mm. and I'd sometimes walk around the yard with him. Um, I organised a charity football match with him and I remember Reggie... Um, for example, in prison at the time, one of the issued um, bits of garments that we wore were these blue and white striped shirts, you know. So today I think they give prisoners sort of grey tracksuits. But back in my day, you'd be issued with a blue and white famous shirt with HMP stamped on it. So I had a, a, a cousin who played for Brentford football team at the time and he brought in his team um, and the manager because they wanted to see Reggie Crane not necessarily play fucking football with me. But mm. it was a, it was a charity event. And um, I had Reggie sign all all the shirts. Um, so I knew him well enough. Um, and, you know, he was a man who, you know, he could pick out innocent and not innocent prisoners. Not that he cared about that. Oh, wow. But I was, I was, um, I was impressed by the fact that in one of his last books before he died, he did write in his book that when he met me, um, I was probably the only prisoner that he'd ever met who he truly believed was innocent. So um, not in them words, but, you know, it's an accolade when you've got a prisoner of that statue sort of declaring that, you know, he's seen them all, heard them all, but he believed me. And he even took the trouble to write it in his book. And I think that was just after I was released. And then obviously when he died, I went to his funeral because I'd mingled a mix with all those gangsters. You know, mm. I was never on their side. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But, you know, I come out of my cell sitting on the landing, having a cup of tea and they'd all be around me. And I was welcomed in the black clique, the white clique, the gangster clique, because I was not one of them. And I didn't conform to who they were or what they were. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I, I, I got to know him very well. You know, he's a man. Um, you know, he came into my cell on one occasion. I'm not going to give you too much detail, but he came into my cell on one occasion, cried his eyes out. Really? Mm, sat down there, cried his eyes out. So, you know, so he, he felt we knew each other enough that he could come and confine in me. You know, this is a, a, a gangster that he has this mythical reputation about him. Mm. I, I had a lot of time for him, a lot of respect for him, uh, not because he was Reggie Cray, the gangster, but because he was a man who survived those many years in prison. And, and you know, I'd look at people like that and say, I'm not going to fucking be here for that long. Because he was a divering old man. Yeah. And when I say divering old man, I mean, he was someone who had been confined in a cell for 35 years or more. And so he shuffled around the prison. Mm. You know, he was still as sharp as a razor in the sense that, you know, he'd always wear clean clothes, this gold chain around his neck. Um, he was into sort of, you know, these kind of wishing well web things that you had hanging. So he'd have them all hanging from his cell as if like dream catchers, I think they well, call them. You can get them in prison. You get lots of things in prison. When, when you're in the deep, dark bellies of the prison, you can get a lot of things. I, I mean, it progressed over the years. I mean, as I say, when I first went, it was a piss pot. Mm. It was a cardboard table and chair. Yeah. But over the years, you can accumulate things and prisons progressed in that they introduced sanitation so you could piss and shit in a toilet in your cell as opposed to going down the landing and queuing up and waiting for every other fucker to fill it up. So... So, yeah, things did progress. And Reggie had one of those cells where he had everything in his cell. And I'm not talking about luxuries. I mean, you're talking about a small nine by six full of things that he'd get sent in from people. You know, I'd go out on visits, for example, the visiting hall. So we all go into the same visiting hall. And then you'd have all wonders of celebrities coming up to visit him. You, you, really? You, yeah, who would come to visit him simply because they wanted to be touched by Reggie Cray. Wow. Uh, sometimes it was the wannabe criminals, you, yeah. you, you, you know, um, and, and sometimes it was people who were writing books or, or something. But Reggie was, he was, it was a sharp man who I, I truly believe should have been released to, to live the rest of his life outside because he wasn't a threat. He didn't have... You know, he didn't have the pulling power of, of the gangster. I mean, he was locked up in the 60s. Yeah. He, you know, he died in prison or he was released just before he died. I think he died in Norwich, actually, from where... He might have done. Yeah, if, if I've got the right one, because obviously I get the, the two mixed quite quite a lot. Is it, was it, did, I guess, because the celebrity... I was going to ask you whether or not he was aware of his, like, 
how famous he was, or yeah. infamous he was. Yeah, he played up to it. Did he? Yeah, of course he did. I mean, he, he, was, he wasn't somebody who kind of stood on the landings and puffed his chest out. He's too old for that. But, mm. but, but he recognised, he, he always looked to, I thought, exploit the situation because, you know, he could earn no money in prison. You can't earn money in prison. So if someone wanted to write a book about it, about him, he'd welcome that person. Somebody was offering an opportunity to sell his T-shirts. He'd welcome those people. When people made a lot of money out of, of him, he very got he got very little of that, I I, I think. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think initially, and I didn't know him here uh, uh, as a young man when he was first in the prison, but in the dying days when I did know him, mm. um, and I met him not just in one prison, but, you know, I, I we, we kind of crossed paths in other prisons as, as well. Um, and there are stories about him that I can't share with you now, but I'm going to share in my book. But but it, but he's, it, you, you know, um, he he earned a lot of respect in prison, but he also lost a lot of respect in prison because of what he become uh, and the way he conducted himself on occasion. Well, negatively, it depends how you look at it. Yeah, it, you, you know, it depends on what your perspective is about people and who they are and, and what what you believe. I suppose people like Reggie Cray, he had a reputation of being this notorious gangster from this twin, and there were films made about him, legends, and all this kind of thing. Um, but the reality, from what I saw with my own eyes and what I heard with my own ears, um, lots of other prisoners were exposed to that too, um, and some didn't take to it kindly. You know what they right. saw and what they witnessed. Was he a bit of a, a bit of a strange character? Because I, I've watched a few like movies that depict him and stuff, and obviously they dramatise that to to sell tickets. But he seemed a bit a bit odd. Was he a bit odd, or was he a straightforward London gangster? You it, you see what you get. It depends what you define as a straightforward London gangster. You know, he, he he's not like all the other gangsters in the sense that they'd done some time, went out, might have done something else, and ended up back in prison like Foreman or or some of these other. Uh, sort of notorious gangsters with reputations. He's a man who spent many, many years in prison. So, of course, he's going to be a bit strange and behave in a particular way. You know, you couldn't have a a straight conversation like I am with you right now with Reggie for, for too long because his mind would wander and he'd diver off over there and do something. Not because he was mentally insane yeah. or because he couldn't hold the conversation, but he lost interest quite quickly. And that's the repercussions of a prison cell. I mean, it happened to me. It still happens to me, you know, so you wander off in a different direction. Um, mm. I've been allowed, you know, I've got my freedom back and I've sort of taken in new memories and thoughts, but he's, you know, were confined to a prison cell and prison conversations for 35 years. I mean, what do you talk about after two years? You know, you've done all the talking. You can talk about your memories on the outside. Now you're just talking about what goes on in prison. And the fact is, we're all seeing the same thing. So what the fuck do you want to talk about? <laughs> That's true, actually. I've never thought yeah. about that. Yeah, well, you know when we did an episode a few weeks back where we, we basically did an episode where it was like, what would we do if we were stranded on a desert island? If you could take one person with you, blah, blah, blah. I said, didn't I? I think it would take three years of living with somebody who's super interesting before they get fucking boring. And because that's based on nothing. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd say it's shorter. Really, I, I, I'd say it's you know based on my experience of being in prison and finding people interesting initially. Once I told you their story six times, ten yeah. times, fifteen times, like Reggie, but, for fuck's sake, mate. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's so true. Three years, man. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're good. Have you have you seen um, the the film Legend yes. by to- Tom Hardy? Yeah. How accurate is that portrayal? I, 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 on, on the outside, I don't know because I didn't know him. I wasn't even born when he ended up in in prison. I, I can only reflect on 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 him as a man that I met in prison. I'm not going to talk about he's I, I, what I see, what I hear, I believe that's me. Mm. And, you know, is authentic, and, and and that's what I base my relationship on with someone like Reggie Cray, based on our relationship. And when I say our relationship, you know, our acquaintance in prison and mm. the time that I knew him. He wasn't a mate of mine that we'd sit down and smoke a joint together or anything like that. He had influence in prison, but it wasn't a fearful influence. It wasn't like... Oh, really? No, it wasn't a fearful influence. People didn't fear him. He didn't have an army of prisoners around him prepared to do his dirty work. That gone long time ago. I suspect that might have been something in the early 70s when he was first in prison and was still a bit of a boxer. I mean, he still fancied himself as a boxer even in his 70s. He would go out onto the exercise yard and he stand there with his shirt off you know he's got this old man's body but still <laughs> still looking oh, someone said that about me the other day actually when they watched this netflix series they said nice body but it's an old man's body now oh <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> but he'd go out on the exercise yard in his little kind of skimpy shorts if you like no top on and he'd bounce around sort of sparring in, in thin air sometimes you know, we'd all do it. We'd all have some pads and, and stuff and we'd go into a room like this that gets really hot in the laundry room mm. and we'd spar, you know, yeah. as a way of working out, getting a sweat up. And he'd often take part in that. And he still had a grip like a lion, you know. Did he? Punch like a sledgehammer, you know, <laughs> even when he was aging, you, you know. Yeah. And he just had that. 
he had that aura around him where people respected him, at least initially, you know, and then as, as, as people, new people would come into the prison, you know, they'd be in awe and they'd watch him and they'd, that's Richie Cray, but they'd say that about other prisoners who were notorious at the time, whose names, you know, some of them were notorious for really bad reasons. Right. Um, um, people would say that, but after a while, when you've seen it, five, ten times, you don't even give it a second glance. And he was just one of those. It must be weird because he must have been high up in the kind of prison hierarchy sort of thing to start with when you go in. And then over the years, you get the, the new, fitter, younger men come in. You see that sort of that foothold on it crumble away. You, you do. And it's really about respecting. I mean, they still respect him because of the reputation that he's had. And this hierarchy that you talk about in the prisons that I was in existed to a certain extent, but it was really about money. It was about if you're a gangster on the outside and, you know, loosely use the term gangster. But if you're somebody who was making good money on the outside, you know, importing, trafficking, drugs, mm. then you've got money. So when you're in prison, that buys you a lot. You know, right. it, it buys you a lot of influence, you know, not not in terms of protection power or anything like that, but it just means that you've got a little bit more money in your canteen, yeah. which means you can buy more tobacco, which you can then use as contraband to trade. And that just brings you power. It means you get more... I don't know, niece biscuits or fucking custard creams or, or <laughs> something. But it is as trivial as that, you yeah. know, because you don't have the luxuries. I mean, I'll tell you something. When I was in with Reggie and a couple of other gangsters who were banged up next door to him, it was the first time I saw a quantity of drugs that I'd never seen before in my life. And this was in prison, a maximum prison. And I remember the, the guy was banged up two doors me. So I was in, say, I was in free. Reggie was opposite me. And then you had a gangster on the right of him, a, 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 a sort of, wife killer i suppose next to me and then some other kind of prisoner mm -hmm. and i remember the other prisoner Stephen was his name i remember him coming into my cell on one occasion with a, a sainsbury's carrier bag full of cannabis it was just so much i'd never seen a big lump it was like bulky out now prisoner didn't smuggle that in you know that's the influence that people who have money can have in prison so they pay a guard a guard brings it in and then it gets chopped up by the smaller prisoners and then it's distributed around the prison for a quarter of tobacco or an extra packet of wow. biscuits and when he came into my cell and he was terrified because he i remember him coming in with this sainsbury bag full of cannabis and saying he didn't know what to do with it <laughs> and so i sort of said you need to chop it up into small pieces you know like two pound deals five pound deals and then just plant it around the prison convince as many people as you can who you will pay maybe a little half an ounce or something to mm. look after it. Um, mm. Wow! Did but did Red, going back to Reggie quickly? Did mm. he did he draw things? Did he? I've I've heard that he like used to draw a lot of things. Yeah, I've pay. I've got a few of those things. I mean, he, he what what he would often do. Um, it, 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 this was his kind of famous thing, if yeah. you, if you like. So there would often be a picture of him and his brother posing as boxers, you know, in their younger days. And I've got a couple of these myself where he he, he he'd come and he'd give you these old black and white printed, you know, off of a printer photograph with his signature on this. So you say, to my dear friend Raphael from Reggie Cray, in his, in his scruffled writing. Now, if you don't and are not used to his writing, you probably couldn't read it because, again, Diverin and the same with his writing. Mm. Um, but, yeah, he did use to, to draw, but that was more Charlie Bronson. Charlie Bronson, I remember when he sent me a copy of his book and he did some very dark drawings. You, you, you know, he's famous for his very dark, bloody kind of drawings, a bit like Dali type things, you know, weird kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, that reminds me, actually, I lent the book to a friend and he's never given me it back. <laughs> <laughs>